All right, welcome to the Meat and Potatoes podcast. It is one day before Halloween, and we have our first guest from Australia. We're joined by Rob Newman, who is the Managing Director and CEO of NearMap. Good morning. Hey, Garrett. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. I say morning because it's 5 a.m. for you. It's 5 a.m., so uh, one of the joys of running a, a company between Australia and the United States is uh, I get to uh, live some pretty long hours, but it's, it's good. I like it. <laughs> good. Yeah, if you uh, weren't an early bird, um, or at least uh, could control your sleep, this would not be a good job. Um, <laughs> people that do not like waking up. Um, all right, so we're going to get into, you know, you guys have a Utah and United States presence, but uh, for those that don't know, why don't you explain what NearMap is and your history with the company? Yeah, NearMap is an interesting, exciting company. At first, I'd explain that we're a technology company um, and some really cool technology in our company. But the problem we solve for our customers who are businesses is um, providing them information about the real world. So the way we do that is we have our own camera systems that are mounted in planes and capturing imagery um, about the real world. And so why do that? Well, there's lots of businesses that do jobs outside. They might be quoting for a job. They might be replacing a roof. They might be doing an insurance claim. It might be local government assessing the, the tree cover in a local area. Um, they all need to go outside to do that. But with NearMap, we have such high quality content about the real world that you can actually do your job from your desk. And you know, interestingly, in these times, remote working is something that's uh, obviously even more important. So that's what we, in a nutshell, that's what we do. But lots of detail behind that, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, spending a little bit of time on your website, the images look very, you know, crystal clear. And, you know, you can see a ton of value for, for various industries and various verticals. And you can imagine a bunch of lazy people. This was like a godsend to them too, right? Of, oh, cool. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Right. A absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting. We started as an imagery company. So, you know, if you're used to satellite view on your phone, you kind of get a, a view of what's on the ground. Our big difference is it's just so much clearer. You already said that, right? Yeah. And um, so that means if you really want to work out, can I put a solar panel on a roof? Is there a vent there or is it just a shadow? You need the, the clarity that we have. And then we're just updating it really frequently as well. So, you know, you know that what we're looking at is what's currently on the ground. We call it the truth on the ground is kind of one of yeah. the slogans. We yeah. Cool. So, yeah, that was one of my questions. Is it satellites or planes? And you've already answered that. So it's airplanes with really nice cameras, it sounds like. Yeah. And uh, Garrett, if you ever get a chance to see one of our cameras, I defy you within 30 seconds to identify any component that looks like a camera. <laughs> right these things are i mean we custom design um these even down to grinding our own lenses so that's how sophisticated the technology is i mean we fly at 12 to eighteen thousand feet above ground level and we yeah and so it's, it's very high up there and taking photos on the ground that have resolution of, of a couple of inches right so each pixel is a couple of inches so if you want that crystal clear picture when you're that high up in the sky it, there's a lot of technology involved in that um, one of our engineers gave an analogy the other day. Imagine you're standing on um, on a boat on the lake in Salt Lake, and it's a bit windy, and the boat's rocking around. And something like five miles away, somebody's holding up a dime, and you're holding a laser pointer, and you have to point that laser pointer at the dime and keep it on the dime the whole time. Imagine how complex that is. Right? Right. <laughs> That's just kind of some of the technology that goes into what we do. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. And. Um... So I'd imagine there's certain governments or agencies that would find a lot of value in that as well, right? Yeah, a little bit. Um, actually, most of our customers are across a very broad range of industries. So as I mentioned, we do sell to local government um, and they use that for a variety of purposes, whether it's, as I mentioned, assessing the green space in your local area, whether it's determining local taxes, whether it's um, for emergency services because they want up to date of what houses are there and if there's an emergency that they need to uh, issue you know e nine one one services to you know you want up to date content so yes government is part of it but insurance uh, roofing construction transport utilities all have assets outside or do jobs outside so it, you know it's amazing the breadth of customers that we actually have but they're all businesses we really sell to gotcha. Hmm. Interesting. So um, in your history with the company, 
Um, you've been involved with them for a long time, but how did you come to be the CEO? Uh, it's one of those stories of you see something and you fall in love with it, right? Um, so I was a venture capitalist at the time. And as always, you meet, you know, 100 people a year with crazy ideas. And uh, Stuart Nixon, the founder of the company, invited me over to his house to say, hey, Rob, I've got something I want to show you. And uh, let me tell you, his lounge room was not like any other lounge room you would have seen, right? It was full of computers in racks and cameras on the floor and this big pod thing that's going to attach to the side of the plane, right? So anyway, I kind of walk in. He said, Rob, in th I'm going to show you in three hours what everybody else takes three months to do. And so what he'd done is he'd taken some pictures, obviously from his first generation camera system, and he kind of loaded those all up from the hard drive into the computers in the racks. And I watched before my eyes as literally all these images came together to form this beautiful photo mosaic of the crown. And it literally happened all automatically. And before that, people had to manually stitch all the individual pictures together to create, create what you see as satellite view, for example. And yeah. he completely revolutionized how the technology worked, both from capturing the imagery as well as processing it. And, um, you know, so short version of the story, I was looking to invest in the company. Um, and as it turned out, it was acquired by another company. Um, I'd been engaged, you know, I was fascinated by it. So I went on the board of directors, actually. Um, so I was on the board of directors from 2009, 2008, 2008. And then um, as, as this is all an Australian company then, um, and then as we started to expand to Australia, because I'd lived in the US and because I had experience in taking other Australian companies to the US, the board asked me to step in as uh, CEO. And I said, sure, I'll do that for six months. And that was five years ago. <laughs> cool. Um, and you haven't looked back since. Um, you might not know the answer to this off the top of your head, but you've been to, to Salt Lake. And so, you know, it's in between two mountain ranges. Um, with the, the camera and the planes, how many times would it need to fly over to get the Salt Lake Valley? Yeah, good question. I'm not sure of the exact number of times we'd fly over. We do talk about, that's a good analogy. We do talk about like plowing the field, which we just fly back and forward. Um, it turns out Salt Lake is one of the more challenging cities in North America to capture um, because of actually those mountain ranges, because we've got such an enormous difference between the valley itself and then the ranges. So we've got this massive height difference. So we actually use it to test uh, some of our newer camera systems and test how our um, survey programs work. But typically, you know, a, a city like Salt Lake, um, a, a survey might take about four hours and a city like Salt Lake would take a couple of days, right? Now, just to give you maybe another idea of how much ahead our technology is of, of most of our competitors, our competitors would probably need four or five times the number of planes to do what we do in a day or two. Right, it's just our technology flies so much higher, so much faster, and gets so much better clarity. Cool, yeah, yeah very fun stuff. All right, so you mentioned you know you were a VC, and uh, you've been pitched to hundreds and thousands, hundreds if not thousands of times. Um, that might influence how you kind of lead as a CEO, right? Because um, you obviously do respect the dreamers and the moonshotters, and uh, Every once in a while, you might have to follow your gut instead of the data, which goes contrary to your gut. So how does, how does your past experience influence you being a leader? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, look, you know, I've kind of been a mix of a startup CEO and a VC through my career. Um, I guess I love technology. I love what it can do for customers. And I love building companies with people and, and bringing people together and taking us all on the same journey. So I think um, as a leader, it's about creating a, a vision of where we can go and where we can take our company, where we can take uh, our technology, where we can take this for our customers. And if you can kind of create that picture of where we're going to be in the future, then hopefully people who, you know, come on board. And I know actually in starting companies, that's often how it would work is you kind of chat with somebody and you go, hey, I got this crazy idea. And somebody else says, I've got a crazy idea. And you put the two crazy ideas together and you go, wow, this is even crazier. Let's go for that, right? And then, uh, but somebody else might come along and they go, you know what? I uh, don't really get your idea enough. But it's this kind of self-forming system. And so um, I love that about startups, which is people come together, share ideas, work collaboratively about where they're going to go. And I think the challenge in building a company, particularly as you get larger and across multiple nations, um, is how do you keep that kind of 
startup vibe of you're all going in the same direction, you're all there for the same purpose. Um, you know, recognize there's challenges, of course, but just create that environment where everybody works together. That's kind of one half of it. That's the very soft, organic half of it. The other half of it is um, it's numbers, it's analytical, right? We've got a business that we have to build and, you know, what are the metrics that drive that? So it's that, that balance between the creating a passion for a company but being very analytical and, and that's, you know, that's what I love about uh, leading a company and leading them at particularly. Yeah. And uh, do you guys get involved with acquisitions at all from, the, from a company perspective? We did our first acquisition um, just just under a year ago, so December last year. Um, it's not a skill set that we had as a company previously, but um, we'd always thought that what we provide is kind of content about the real world. Yep. So whether it's an image, whether it's a 3D model of the world, whether it's um, AI dri deriving analytics about the real world, does a house have a pool, does it have a solar panel, those kinds of information. Um, but what we found was because we have this 3D content, uh, one of our partners was transforming that 3D content into the actual geometry of a roof. Now that's really valuable because if you're a roofer replacing roofs or an insurance company who's looking at um, you know, assessing a, a roof, roof damage claim, or if you're a solar panel installer, you don't want to have to you know, drive on site, climb on a ladder, get up on the roof, manually measure all the dimensions of the roof. If you've got some technology that automatically determines the roof geometry, that's pretty cool, right? So this partner of ours um, was determining the roof geometry semi-automatically out of our content. It was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, and it was, he was starting to sell that through very well as well. So um, we did our first acquisition, as I said, just under a year ago. And that's been very successful for us in, in uh, North America. And, and uh, continue, that business is continuing to grow for us. So, yeah, look, will we do more acquisitions? Yes, we will. Um, they'll probably be like that, where it's something that adds value to the solution that we're providing. Cool. Yeah. Um, so Australia based company, but you guys have an office here in Utah. What was the reasoning behind that? Yeah. We, when you look around at, at uh, where to expand in, in North America, and I'd actually lived in Silicon Valley. So in the Bay, you know, San Francisco Bay area um, from 1991 to 2001, your natural tendency is, oh, well, let's just go to you know, Silicon Valley and, or New York or something like that. And you go you know, big, the big centers. But actually, as you look at it through a lens of, you know, where's a great place to live? Where is an emerging technology hub? Um, where are people motivated and got good experiences? Um, it naturally came down to Salt Lake, actually. And I didn't have a lot, to be honest, I didn't have a lot of experience with Salt Lake prior to this. But um, as I got to know the area, know the people in Salt Lake, I thought, this is fantastic, right? Um, there's a really good technology hub. And I mean, you obviously, with your Silicon Slopes uh, podcast know that. But for us, for me, from outside, this is this is the right kind of emerging environment. So when we chose um, uh, Salt Lake, which is a little over five years ago, um, it, it, it was a really good decision. And I'm very happy we're there. And we'll, we'll continue to have uh, uh, Salt Lake City as our base in North America. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, we have a rugby team here. I don't know if you're a rugby or or cricket fan. We don't have a cricket team that I know of, but we do have a rugby team and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, one of our um, one of our uh, very earliest employees um, was actually a rugby player at uh, BYU. So, um, and uh, I think he's got it. He, every time I see him, he shows me his ring, his uh, championship <laughs> ring. So uh, <laughs> he's very proud of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you a, a rugby fan or a cricket fan? Neither, both? Uh, actually, there's two uh, football codes in Australia. There's rugby, and then there's another uh, game called Australian Rules Football. And uh, basically, Australia is divided. Australia is a very unified country, other than one thing is which code of football do you follow? You either yeah. follow Australian Rules Football or you follow rugby. Uh, I grew up in a, um, uh, an Australian Rules Football uh, state, so rugby, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I must admit, when I was in, when I lived in, in uh, California, I did get into uh, American football. So, um, you know, first I didn't get the game, but now, yeah, it's, it's actually yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, Australian rules uh, football, rugby is fantastic to watch. And, uh, you know, those guys are all probably mostly insane and just yep. as tough as nails. Um, <laughs> it's fun to watch, even, even if you don't know all the rules. Um, well, cool. So, uh, Obviously, we've got a pandemic, and it's uh, bad for uh, certain business models and good for certain business models. How has it been for your guys' business model? 
Well, first of all, I want to say, you know, it's obviously a very difficult situation globally. Um, and our first thought was, how do we look after our staff? Um, you know, and so we immediately went to a work from home uh, environment. Um, and we've continued that. And in fact, we've learned that actually that's working very well for our staff. So we'll continue with the work from home environment. So that was kind of our first reaction. But once, you know, once you kind of say, look, we've got to look after the, the people in our company, we've got to look after our finances then, and, and our customers, then you kind of step up and say, well, what does this mean for us? Um, interestingly, um, we're a business that enables remote working. And guess what? A lot of people have to work more remotely. You know, the ability to go on site, the ability to, to um, uh, you know, or can't even work from their office. So what we found is most of our customers actually had an increasing need for our solution. And, um, you know, so I'm not going to call it a, a tailwind or positive, but I'm just saying, I think, you know, because obviously some of our customers are negatively affected in the, affected, sorry, in this environment. But, um, yeah, I, I would say that overall for our business, uh, we've, we've survived very well through this and we're helping our customers transition and net, 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 it's been a positive. Yeah. Um, how do you, uh, this is kind of the meat and potatoes question and it's, um, how do you kind of manage your time and your life? What tricks do you use both, um, with just your mental or physical state as well as, you know, technical tools? Um, it's trickier for you because you're on the other side of the world from this office here. So what are some, what are some ways you do it? Yeah, a really good question. And it's funny, COVID has actually changed my life considerably. Um, so, you know, I'm sure like a lot of the CEOs you speak to, we travel a lot, right? You're traveling to see customers, you're traveling to see partners, you're traveling to see, you know, um, your staff and so on. And being Australian based with the US operation, I always spent a lot of time traveling back and forward. Uh, and to be honest, I enjoyed it. It's, it's hard because um, you're swapping time zones. Um, but now it's almost my life's completely flipped, right? I literally spend from 5 a.m. in the morning till 4 p.m. in the afternoon in front of the screen, right? And, uh, <laughs> and but net net actually, to, from a personal point of view, it's actually been positive because um, I finish my day a little earlier now. I get to spend some time with my family. And, um, but the one thing that does keep me saying whether I'm traveling a lot or stuck in front of a screen is you can kind of see behind me a whole bunch of running bips, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that ability at the end of the day to kind of get outside, go for a run, clear the head, work out what, you know, you know kind of work out whatever the issue was of the day or <clears throat> um, think forward. It, it, for me, it's, you know, people do meditation, other people do, you know, uh, yoga, whatever. For me, running is that, that release. You know, if I've got a really tough problem, I'll be 10 minutes into a run and I'll go, that's the answer. Got it, right? And the rest of the run just flows. And yeah, so um, I love it. Yeah, so that's, you know, so um, work hard. Um, so I guess the, the philosophy is work hard, use running as a release, and then, you know, make sure you balance it in time with the family. Try and keep the weekends protected. Yeah, cool. So is, are those... Uh marathons that you run or half marathons what's your flavor my favorite distance is the half marathon um it's it's long enough to be challenging but still short enough to be fast the marathon kills you i mean they're they're tough but i did spend 10 years of my life uh, doing um, triathlon so i ended up doing three ironman races um and uh, those are really tough so uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'll take your word for it <laughs> Very cool. So uh, is there a marathon that you w would love to do that you haven't done in the world? Yeah, Boston. Boston. Boston Marathon. I actually qualified for Boston, uh, oh, wow, many, many years ago. And uh, it must be 20 years ago, I qualified for Boston. I was uh, training for it, got injured and, um, and couldn't attend. And then as cross training, my friends got me into swimming and biking, which is how I got into triathlon and uh, never got back to do the Boston Marathon. So now training for the Boston Marathon, you've got to actually got to qualify is the hard part. So again, given the, the work hours, it's a little challenging to put in the time, but, uh, and I'm a little older now too. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Um, so uh, what are your guys' plans to grow uh, into, into new markets? You know, you're obviously uh, doing well in Australia and in America. But, uh, you know, the world's a big place. How do you kind of frame that in your mind and what's your strategy there? Yeah, really good question. Um, it turns out that, that we're, you know, we're very successful in North America, but we've got such potential ahead of us, right? 
So, you know, our last reported results, because we're a listed company here in Australia, our last reported results were just shy of 30 million um, ACV or ARR, um, whichever term you want to use, um, in, in North America. But this is a, a, at least a billion, if not a $2 billion market opportunity. And nobody's really grabbed it in the way that we're grabbing it. So um, it's a highly fragmented market, lots of players with older technologies and older solutions. So we, we sit um, with a very small market share in what is potentially a very large market and a highly differentiated solution. So I'm very excited about, you know, continuing our growth in North America. Um, and then, you know, putting kind of the, remember that analytical or financial lens over it, um, the kind of margins we get out of, out of our free cash flow margins we get out of our, out of our business are phenomenal. So what we would do is drive our success in North America, which then funds our expansion into Europe and to Asia. So, um, so that's, that's the plan, continue our success in North America, really drive that growth. And then from there, uh, Europe and Asia are next. Now, you know, of course, it gets a little more complicated in those because they're different languages, different business environments. So, you, you know, have to work our way through which countries specifically, but uh, certainly wherever there is, you know, built up environment and a, and a good e economic environment, we would, we would look to expand to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two more questions, both a little bit weird. Um, in the United States, they're called rednecks usually, and they, they're not really fans of government knowing what they're doing in, in some instances, and uh, they just like uh, to live their lives, um, and they love privacy, right? I don't know what the equivalent of is in Australia, but um, I've had several stories over uh, you know, my life of um, why you know, they're building big, big garages or big you know, closet huts. Well, because I don't want people to see what I have for any number of reasons, right? Um, so how do you guys deal with privacy? And I imagine it's something you have to think up and, uh, and make sure you're all, you're covered there. But um, what's the strategy in like dealing with all the regulations and rules and just not irritating people with privacy issues? Yeah, um, I guess Australia has its equivalent of, of, uh, of those people and, and uh, look, every country does, of course, right? Um, privacy is very important, right? I mean, and I think it's going to become increasingly so and the data that you have is your data. <clears throat> it, you know, it's what you own rather than maybe some large corporation. Um, we're very sensitive to it. So one of the things that we ensure is that what we see is can, what, what can be seen, right? It's not as if we're going inside a house or looking inside or doing anything like that. The data that we see is the data that anybody could see if they were um, up in the sky or walking past us uh, on a street, right? Um, we are also at a resolution that <clears throat> um, personal information is, is impossible to extract. So, you know, it, you can't tell facial features, you can't see license plates. It's at a resolution where Yes, I can tell there's a vent on a roof, but I don't know, um, you know, I couldn't read the, the name of the of, of, of who made that vent on the roof, for example, just to give you a, an idea. So it's, it's being sensitive to the level of quality and resolution that we capture so that it's the, the kind of assets that are on the ground rather than, um, rather than the other way around. The other important part of this is we sell only to businesses. So this is not published information that anybody can just go, hey, have a look, I wanna have a look. So businesses have to subscribe to our service and they're using that for a business purpose, right? They're using that, as I said, to you know help with um, replacing a roof or help with putting solar panels on a roof. So, in many senses, you know, we believe that look part of part of our ambition is actually to shape the livable world. And we believe a lot of what we do is help our business customers make the world a better place, right? So, you've got to balance those things of privacy, but net net, I feel very uh, very positive about what we provide to um, uh, to the environment, right? Because we're helping make this a, a more livable place. Yeah, absolutely. Great answer. Um, all right, last question, and then uh, we'll let you get started with the rest of your day. Uh, <laughs> so one of the many cool things of, about Australia is all the dangerous animals, of which there's many. A lot of ways that they can kill you in Australia. Um, have you had any close encounters with dangerous insects, reptiles, mammals? Anything? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got a, a, a small um, a vacation place um, south of, of Perth. And I was up a ladder one day. Um, there was a problem with the guttering, so I was, I was fixing that. And this was the middle of summer, and so there's not a lot of water around. And so as I was fixing the gutter, it turned out some water had dripped down um, below me on the ladder. Now, as I climbed off the ladder, there was water pooled in the middle of the V of the ladder, of course, right? And of course, a snake 
<laughs> very dangerous snake, uh, <laughs> a black tiger snake, by the way, in case you want to look that one up. Uh, a black tiger snake had decided that it would slide across and actually sit under, or curl itself up underneath my ladder and, and drink the water. So as I hop off the ladder, I go, hmm, that was pretty close. But you know what? Um, <laughs> I'm glad that it was underneath the ladder and not where I was stepping off because I probably would have got bitten. But yeah, look, you know, Australia, there is that perception of Australia that there's a lot of dangerous animals. Um, in many respects, uh, you know, most of, the, most of our animals are, are um, you know, like kangaroos and so on and are all pretty safe. Yes, there's some crazy insects. Yes, there's some crazy spiders, I've got to say. Um, yeah. And I think nine or eight, sorry, I think it's eight of the top 10 most poisonous snakes in the world are Australian. Um, but you kind of get used to it. You don't see them that often. They're generally not out to get you. So as long as you don't step on them, you're okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a, well, I've, I've, I've been to South Africa and there's the black mamba there mm -hmm. and the puff adder and they're, they're probably on the list. But yeah, Australia's got most of them. And the, the guy that I was with is like, if it's the puff adder, maybe we'll do an anti-venom. We'll see. Um, but if it's the black mamba, 100% sure, because that's like <laughs> the only way you'll you'll survive. And even then, who knows? I'm like, oh, all right, here we go. You know, and <laughs> you just get really unlucky and that's it. Um, but uh, I'd love to visit one day um, and see some of it with my own eyes. Um, yeah, look, Australia is a, a beautiful country um, in many respects, you know, um, uh, having lived in the United States and lived in Australia, they're both beautiful countries, both got you know, fantastic uh, living environments, similar cultures in many respects. Um, but uh, yeah, Australia is quite unique in some respects, right? You know, particularly the outback and, and those places. So um, yeah, if you do get the opportunity, be uh, happy to, to host you and show you around a little bit. Cool, great. All right, well, thank you, Rob. Um, appreciate your time and uh, thanks for being the first Australian guest on Meat and Potatoes. Garrett, really nice to meet you and thank you. Thanks.